Now, for the young people and the boys and girls that are here, remember, we've been thinking about this missionary man whose name is Jonathan Goforth. And Jonathan Goforth, remember, his birth is on the 10th of February, 1859. Very important year for revival. Whenever he was five, he was being taught the Psalms on his mummy's knee. Remember when he was five, he wanted to buy candy because a man gave him five cents. And he struggled that Saturday night, wanting to go to the shop on the Monday. And he gave it into the missionary offering because there was a missionary there in his church. When he was five, his father got him to plow a field and he planted some corn and he seen a, a tremendous harvest. When he was 18, he got converted. He then went to Knock Bible College and remember what happened to him there. Boys treated him very badly and he had no real good clothes and a tailor gave him a suit of clothes. And this all come about in answer to prayer. And then, remember, he married a girl called Rosalind and in 1880, they set off for the land of China. Now, that's where we left our story um, last week. I'm going to read again a verse from the Bible, this time Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Listen to these words, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, remember I told you, oops, that's good. Life is like a jigsaw, right? And the pieces of your life are put together from the day of your birth to the day of your death. And every one of these pieces we can put together to form a composite picture of uh, Jonathan Goforth's life. But that's also a picture of your life. And here's in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the psalmist, or, or the apostle Paul is saying, the psalmist believed this as well, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his uh, purpose. Now, when Jonathan Goforth got to China, he was there for six months and he was started getting some wages. And they decided, him and his wife, Rosalind, that they would tithe their money. And in six months' time, they discovered, well, we've already given a tenth of our income to the Lord's work. And um, the wife said to him, well, Jonathan, that's great. We don't have to give any more the rest of the year. Uh, we can uh, keep the bit of money that we have. And he says, oh, no, dear. We have learned about the joy of giving. The strange thing is, the more we give, we don't give to get, but the more we give, the more we seem to have to give. And after six months there, having given away part of their income, a very strange thing happened. Their house went on fire. And all their belongings, everything perished. And if you could just imagine standing outside your home, watching it burnt to the ground. And of course, in those days, there probably wasn't the same fire engines or people rushing to your aid uh, at, at that time. So, so the house burnt down to the ground. Uh, and John go forth, you know, he was sad. But he wasn't mad at God because he believed in the joy of giving and he believed that the Lord would give them another house, a better house, and God would replace all their belongings. And that's exactly what the Lord did. It was like a miracle seeing a new house built and everything restored because um, he believed in the joy of giving to God and God, of course, gave it back to him. Now, in China, there was another miracle. In China, he had to learn Chinese. And Chinese is a very, very hard language to learn. Some of you find English hard. So do I. But imagine trying to learn Mandarin Chinese. Very, very difficult. And he really struggled. And, and one time he was praying to God and he says, Lord, if you don't help me to learn this language and master this language, I'm going to fail as a missionary. I'm going to be up there speaking in Chinese and they're going to laugh at me. And, and he said, nobody will pay any attention and they'll be distracted because of, of this difficulty that I have with the language. Well, this particular day, he was set off to go to church and he had his Bible and he wanted to speak to the people in the Mandarin Chinese language. And he was very, very nervous. 
And he got up and he was amazed. All that he had studied, the right syllables, the right expressions, the right words, all that he wanted to say, he was able to say it. And he got very excited. And he was very, very happy. And again, he looked upon that. That's a miracle, God. Thank you. You have helped me so much uh, to, to master this language. A few days later, he discovered from one of the students that the students of the college over in China, they had got together and they were praying as well as the students in this college in Knockville. And they were praying that the Lord would help him to master the language. And he was really amazed because again, he put that down. This is a wonderful miracle that God has helped me even to do something that's very difficult to learn this language. And maybe you're facing something that's really, really difficult. And you're wondering, well, how am I going to cope? How am I going to get through this? Well, you could ask the Lord for help because he's still the God who specializes in impossibilities and ask the God for miracles. And we, we should be praying for miracles. And we should expect when we ask God to do things, we should be expecting God to do things for us. Whether that's the healing of the body or whether that's bringing new families into the church or whether that's helping us with the finances or helping you cope with whatever struggles you have uh, at this time. Then he experienced another miracle because in the 1900s, there was something happened in China. And here's a representation of a Chinese man and he's got a dagger in his hand. wonder what that was all about. Well, in the 1900s in China, the beginning of the 1900s, there was a group of men rose up in China and their idea was kill all the foreigners. Let's kill all the missionaries. And Jonathan Goforth and his family were really afraid and the Chinese Christians that had got converted, they were actually saying to him, you need to think about leaving because these people are deadly serious. They're going to kill you. So he, he got his wife and, and children. Uh, by this time, they had 11 children. And uh, they got them all into a couple of wagons and a couple of horses, and, and they, were, they were journeying down the road. And all of a sudden, they came across this group of men, about 200 men, and they had guns, they had daggers, they had stones. And the minute Jonathan saw them, he got out of the, the wagon and, and, and sort of run in front of the horses and shout, don't kill now, don't kill, take whatever you want. You see, he believed that if they took everything, even their money out of their pockets and took all their provision, wouldn't matter because God would resupply that because God was able. But one of the men came up and he had a big sword and he took a swipe at Jonathan Goforth. Jonathan Goforth had a helmet on to protect himself and it cleaved the helmet in two, just missing his neck, but it, it cut into his shoulder and um, he uh, was, was, was injured and, and of course they, they, he thought he was going to die. But again, he said he experienced another miracle that he didn't die. And somehow that crowd of 200 men, even though they had injured him, they let him through. And they had to travel. They called it a thousand miracle miles because where they lived, they were going to the port in Shanghai. And they had to travel a thousand miles through very dangerous territory with these type of men shouting, kill, 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 kill. And they got to the port in Shanghai and they were so thankful to God. They, they called it a thousand miracle miles. And everybody was safe, him and his wife, and his children with the few bits and pieces of possessions that they had. Now, I wonder, do they get on a boat? Where do they go to next? Come back next week and I'll tell you a wee bit more.